Hello, my name is Alexander Nikolov. Uh, I'm an expert uh, on the European Commission project on developing a guidance, um, a human rights guidance for SMEs. I'm also president of the national coordinating body on corporate social responsibility of Macedonia. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, today at this session to discuss the challenges and support mechanisms for implementation of the UN guiding principles uh, in small and medium-sized enterprises. Uh, we have a diverse uh, and insightful panel uh, here with us. Uh, on my right-hand side, we, we have um, Mr. Brent Wilton, Secretary General of the International Organization of Employers. Uh, we have uh, Ms. Ricarda McFalls in the role of a respondent, uh, Head of the Program on Multinational Enterprises and Social Policy at the International Labor Organization. Uh, On my left side, uh, we have uh, Mr. Tom Dodd, um, uh, Policy Advisor on CSR at the Director General on Enterprise and Industry at the European Commission. That's a long title. Um, we also have uh, Ms. Amanda Romero Medina, uh, Latin America and Caribbean researcher and representative at the Business and Human Rights Resource Center. Uh, and we have um, uh, Mr. Shafi Manafa, uh, UN Global Compact Focal Point in Uganda, and part of the Federation of Uganda Employers. Uh, before we start, start with, the, uh, with the panelists, um, I would like to, uh, to stress that uh, we'll be aiming to leave uh, at least 30 minutes um, for questions and comments from the other participants uh, and for feedback on those uh, from the panelists. Uh, anyone wishing to share uh, a question or a comment must, for regist must first register at the speakers list uh, at uh, the table near the, the entrance. Um, so you, you need to write down your name on the, on the list. Uh, and the speakers list will be open throughout the session. Uh, I advise participants to register even now. Uh, and if you don't have time, uh, uh, if you don't have a question when the time comes, uh, you may simply uh, decide to pass. Tom. Um, in the past uh, 12 months, uh, the CSR team at the um, uh, European Commission has been quite busy with developing uh, uh, the SME Guide, which was uh, referenced yesterday by uh, John Ruggie uh, as an important capacity building uh, tool. Uh, the guide uh, was available along with other materials uh, in front of the, the rooms where we had um, uh, the sessions, uh, and it is also available on the Commission's uh, website. Um, during its development, uh, I know that um, you have had uh, strong consultation efforts uh, and uh, during those uh, you faced a number of uh, controversial questions, dilemmas uh, and uh, opposing viewpoints. Uh, could you please uh, share some of those um, uh, with, the, uh, with the audience? Uh, you have five minutes. Thank you, Alex. Um, one of the first issues I think we faced in developing this guide has simply been the fact that small and medium-sized enterprises vary greatly, hugely, um, and that creates difficulties in risks in terms of providing one guide that is meant to be useful for all. We nevertheless took that risk and think that the result is valuable, valuable as an introductory guide and as a first step. Um, but I don't think we would claim that this is definitive and we very much hope that others will continue to build on it um, and perhaps do deeper things in the light of experience. Um, some of the more precise issues and dilemmas that we've had to address. Um, firstly, this question of, of focusing on the most severe risks of severe human rights uh, impacts by companies. And at the same time, illustrating that all enterprises can have human rights risks. Um, the focus of the guide is essentially on a normal small and medium-sized enterprise within the European Union. So perhaps by definition doesn't necessarily relate to the worst cases of, um, of, of, of negative impacts on human rights by companies. In doing that, we obviously had to take great care not to be trivialising um, what are very important human rights questions. The second dilemma or issue that we had to face is, 
is this balance between respecting human rights as a company and complying with the law, simply complying with the law. Again, for a, for a relatively normal, small and medium-sized enterprises within the EU context, what is the added value of ensuring respect for human rights compared to complying with the law? Um, or put another way, doesn't legal compliance in many circumstances have the same effect as making sure that you respect human rights? Um, th there are a number of answers to that. Um, in many contexts, of course, the law provides for minimum levels of protection and so may well leave space um, that, that, that is not covered. Secondly, of course, a company can be involved in, involved in adverse impacts on human rights, perhaps through suppliers or other business partners, even if itself it hasn't done anything that is illegal. And thirdly, I think we'd risk putting on the table this idea that we can turn the whole thing on its head and that, in fact, human rights due diligence might, in certain, certain circumstances, be a means of helping smaller companies to ensure that they comply with the law. The third dilemma that we looked at is how do we provide a guide, a document, that is sufficiently um, simple, brief, short, to be accessible to the busy owner-manager of a small, medium-sized enterprise, and at the same time ensure that the guide is consistent with the UN guiding principles. Um, we think that we've made a reasonable uh, attempt to do that. One of the questions that we had to look at is jargon. Um, is the word remedy jargon-esque? Is it right to include it in a, in a guide for small and medium-sized enterprises? It's in there. Um, the word leverage, a little bit harder perhaps. Should that be in the guide? Uh, it is in there with an explanation of what it means. Um, due diligence, if I remember correctly, is not. Um, but of course, the, 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 the concept is, but the term isn't. These were all issues that we, that we had to look at, and I'm sure uh, you and others will continue to have to look at them as, as we will um, as we move forward. Um, fourthly, to what extent should this guide stress that there may be a business case for respecting human rights or not? Um, in the end, the line that we took is to acknowledge that there may, in some circumstances, be business advantages coming from respecting human rights, but also to say that, that those advantages may not always exist, and to make clear that in any case, and to be consistent with the UN guiding principles, the bottom line is that companies are expected, expected to uh, ensure respect for, for human rights, whether or not there are any obvious or immediate um, business advantages of doing so. Finally, would the guide take on too much of a negative tone if it's only focusing on risks of negative impacts? Shouldn't the guide also talk about the positive impacts that, of course, many enterprises will have on the enjoyment of, of human rights by others? Um, there again, we, we, we took a line of making a small reference to the fact that companies may well have positive impacts on human rights. But we did not want to confuse the message of the UN guiding principles by combining these two sides in, into one publication. And we make clear that the guide focuses on avoiding risks of negative impacts, because that is the bottom line expectation on companies. Um, very briefly, because I don't want to abuse my time, um, challenges that, that, we, that have come out of this work for the future, knowing what human rights are. Um, this is a question of general education, I suspect, for all citizens, not just for people who work in companies. Um, secondly, is it possible to be more clear about cases when legal compliance is enough or not enough to ensure respect for human rights? Um, and thirdly, is there there's certainly a need, is, is there also an opportunity for trying to create free, uh, easily available information for smaller enterprises on the particular risks that they might face according to sector of business activity um, and perhaps geographical context. Thank you, Tom, for that um, explanation of the, um, uh, of the key dilemmas uh, that um, uh, you faced. 
Um, I would now like to invite um, uh, Brent Wilton uh, to share with us um, uh, some few opening thoughts uh, on the matter. Thank you, Alex, and good morning, everybody, and thank you to the organizers of this conference for having me here on this panel. Just two words on the IOE for those of you who do not know who we are, the International Organization of Employers. We are a global network of employer organizations in 151 countries around the world. One of my members is sitting down at the end, the Federation of Ugandan Employers being one of them. We also operate within the ILO because we play the role of the Secretariat of the Employers Group in the tripartite structure. And our main area of activity is labor and social policy. So very quick. If you'd like to know more, we have a wonderful website and you can read more about us there. This debate on SMEs is a very important one and I'm pleased to see we're finally having which are small and medium-sized enterprises. But there is a difficulty with the whole term. One small enterprise is not the same as another small enterprise, be they in the same location, be they in the same city, be they in the same industry. There are vast differences in the complexity of what we're dealing with here. So I think we have to be realistic in terms of our expectation as to what we're going to achieve in the SME sector in a large part of the world. Not everywhere is like Switzerland. Not everywhere is like Somalia, but there's all sorts of places in between that we have to try and get our heads around. The other issue we've had already this morning is the issue of language. We had a Japanese colleague talking about the fact that there is difficulty even translating some of these concepts into language. That's Japanese. Well, there's about 190 languages in the world, if you don't count Papua New Guinea, which has 400, that we have to deal with. And the issue of being able to bring a common approach, a common understanding, is going to be a real challenge. So I think we have to accept that reality. For me, the issue really is the state duty to protect. The state has to put in place for small and medium-sized enterprises the appropriate legal framework that enables those businesses to operate in the formal economy. We've got countries in the world with massive informality outside of the reach of government. We need to address that if we're going to have any chance of having impact on the ground. If you can get a company to act formally, to act properly, in compliance with the law, then to be quite honest people, that is going to basically be all we can expect from these people as a bulk. Now there will be exceptions to that given the nature of the small and medium sized enterprise. So there is no one size fits all. But re realistically we have to be pragmatic about this. Yes there's a lot that can be done through supply chains, but I don't want to see supply chains becoming focuses of light. Those people remember the HIV AIDS debate in the early days. We had islands of privilege created through supply chain interventions on HIV AIDS. So if you worked for a multinational or a supplier to a multinational, you lived, and if you didn't, you died. We don't want to repeat that experience with human rights. If you work for a multinational or a supplier, you have human rights. If you don't, you don't. We need to avoid that if we can. So within the IOE, we're doing quite a lot with our network of member organizations, and there are things that we're going to be doing more with them. And one of the issues that was raised this morning also was this issue of collective human rights problems, where there is a number of people contributing to a problem. That's an opportunity for a national employer organization member of mine to play a role of bringing people together to have dialogue about how you solve those things. They have a convening power, which is important, because most of their members are also small and medium sized. So through those sorts of networks, we can do some things. We also, though, have to respect that in the world today, not everywhere is the same. People who are small and medium sized enterprise entrepreneurs come from the society in which they live. They do not go to work and become enlightened people of the first world, if they come from the third world. And we have to recognize that it's going to take a while to change perceptions, culture, and we have to be respectful of it. If we're going to have engagement with these countries and these small and medium-sized enterprises in difficult environments, we must be respectful of their reality and work with them to understand the concepts within the context of their country. And this is becoming a very difficult problem with globalization now because we're seeing some stark differences in how people approach issues which we hear called human rights. It is not a shared vision, and we must remember that. So within the IOE, we have done a guide for our members on the guiding principles. It's available if you want it. We've done the material for our members. We're doing webinars 
because we also engage with companies. We're doing direct assistance with companies on human rights issues. So we are here to try and promote and take this forward. But on the SME debate, let's remain realistic in terms of what we can achieve. Tom and the EU have done their guide. It's a contribution. There's material from the Human Rights Council and the working group that they're working on. All great stuff. It needs to be translated. It needs to be broken down and demystified into a language where you have a small and medium-sized enterprise owner saying, do I need to know about this today? If not, then don't talk to me. I've got enough things to do. We need to be able to make sure it's an engagement with them. Thank you. Thank you, Brent. Um, it was mentioned that uh, we are speaking about a very diverse uh, target group. Um, SMEs or MSMEs, um, it can range from a self-employed person in a local grocery store uh, to a company of more than 200 employees and uh, $50 million uh, of annual turnover. Um, when um, developing the EU guide, the EU definition was, uh, was taken, which is um, SMEs are entities with uh, up to 250 um, uh, employees uh, and 50 million um, and up to 50 million uh, euros uh, annual uh, turnover. Um, however, what does this mean? Uh, it's, um, uh, are the, is the situation different in different uh, regions? Do we have various uh, uh, groups of SMEs and uh, what characteristics they have uh, in uh, different regions across the world that may impact the implementation of the UN guiding uh, principles. Um, why don't we start with, uh, with Shafim. Uh, what would be a typical uh, SME in uh, Uganda or in the uh, rest of Africa? Uh, and how may that uh, impact the implementation of the UN guiding principles uh, and uh, the tackling of uh, human rights uh, challenges so within SMEs? Uh, <coughs> Thank you so much, uh, Alexander. First of all, I thank you for considering me to be part of this uh, panel discussion. Now, I work for an employer's organization, but we also host the Global Compact Network in Uganda. And uh, the motivation for us as an employer's organization was that uh, if you look at the 10 principles of the Global Compact, our core business as an employer's organization is already taken care of in the four principles of labor. So it was very easy for us to also take interest and bring on board the remaining six uh, principles, which include human rights, labor, and uh, anti-corruption. Uh, getting back to the issue at hand, Alexander, from your description of an SME when you're developing the EU guide, that would definitely be that would be nef definitely be a, a, a large sized company where I come from. Now we have many definitions depending on the organization, policymakers, academics. There are so many definitions of SMEs. But from where I come from, an SME is classified mainly using two variables. One is the number of full-time employees, and the second variable is the capital investment or annual sales turnover. Specifically in Uganda, micro enterprises have less than five employees, and the annual turnover is uh, 12 million Uganda shillings. This is around uh, less than 4,600 US dollars. A small enterprise has between 50 to between 5 to 50 full-time employees, and the annual sales turnover is less than uh, 360 million Uganda shillings, which is about 140,000 US dollars. And then a medium-sized enterprise has between 50 to 100 employees annual turnover anywhere between 360 million Uganda shillings to less than 30 billion, that is uh, around 1 million US dollars. Now this includes small farmers, family businesses. The management style mostly is top-bottom approach. 
usually lots of unskilled labor and high levels of informality. That's a typical SME. Thank you, Chef, for that uh, description. Um, Amanda, how about Latin America? Well, uh, buenos dias. Thank you very much. Um, I think it's almost the same. Depends on the region, on the sub-region of Latin America. There are more micro uh, enterprises in Central America, ranging from five to ten uh, full-time employees. And uh, also we have a small going from 10 to 50 people in uh, countries like Brazil or Colombia or, or, or Chile. So it depends on that. And I want just to make a clarification besides the informality that prevails in most of these uh, businesses, we have the problem of illegal uh, businesses, uh, particularly in mining and in other extractive industries. So um, this has to do also with a clarification in terms of <coughs> artisanal mining and, and uh, community-owned businesses or ways of living that conflict very, very often with the uh, regularly formally structured and registered uh, businesses. Thanks. Um, Xiaohui, a Chinese per perspective. Uh, <coughs> thank you. Uh, actually, in 2011, uh, the Chinese government uh, uh, come up with, uh, came up with a new definition of scales for uh, enterprises. Uh, they have diff different definitions for different sectors uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, scales. Uh, because I'm from a, a industrial sector, so I will take industrial sector as a, as an example. For instance, uh, uh, if you are from a manufacturing industry, uh, and if you have a uh, employment over 1,000 people, or you have any turnover uh, less than 400 million MB, which is uh, about 50 euro, 50 million uh, euros, you are considered as uh, one of the SMEs. But uh, we also have uh, more detailed uh, definitions within this big, you know, big scale. Uh, we have uh, a definition for middle-sized uh, companies and also for small-sized companies and also macro uh, enterprises. So, for middle-sized enterprises, uh, they are, you know, if you if you if you employ more than 300 and less than 1,000, and if you have any turnover of more than 20 million RMB, which is about uh, uh, 2.5 million or euros, then you are considered as a medium-sized company. And small-sized companies are defined as having more than 20 uh, employees, less than 300, and 3 million annual turnover, uh, surely RMB. And for macro enterprises, uh, you should have a, a, a employment less than 20, or you have an annual turnover below 3 million RMB. Uh, actually, in the past decade, uh, the number of SMEs in China has doubled. Now, uh, according to the official statistics, there are about 11 million uh, SMEs in China, and uh, another 34 million uh, individual economic uh, units or self-employed people. Uh, about 99% of all enterprises in China are SMEs, and uh, they actually create about 60% uh, of all GDPs and 50% of uh, tax revenues for the government, as well as about 80% of uh, employment. Thanks. Um, obviously, uh, when developing um, guides and developing uh, support mechanisms, one need one uh, needs to take into account these uh, these regional differences. Um, when, when interacting with European SMEs um, uh, on the issue of their awareness on the UN guiding principles uh, and in general uh, on the issue of uh, the topic of the business and human rights, uh, it, uh, it is surprising that there is low awareness even in, in Europe. Um, how is the situation um, elsewhere, Amanda? Uh, you, uh, you monitor the situation in 34 countries in Latin America and, um, and the Caribbean. Uh, how are SMEs doing in terms of their awareness of, of this topic uh, and the UN guiding uh, principles? Uh, and what would be the key challenges in uh, their implementation among SMEs? Um, 
challenges? Well, there are many challenges indeed. Uh, I work for the Business and Human Rights Resource Center, an NGO, an international NGO, that uh, monitors the situation of uh, businesses uh, related to um, abuses of, of human rights in 195 countries, but my region in Latin America, we have seen that there are less willingness of uh, SMEs to respond to when, whenever uh, a, a complaint is publicized, and we ask them to respond to the complaints. And they say, why us? Uh, why, why do you call me? What how, what's wrong with us? Why don't you look at the big ones that are the, 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 the more important and the <laughs> ones that cause more damages? We are just a small or a medium enterprise, and we don't uh, find this fair that you call us. And this is something that we have found interesting to say that perhaps in terms, for instance, of extractive industries, we have found that more and more these small and medium enterprises are causing environmental and social impacts on communities in Latin America. And so very often we have also found that there are some Canadian uh, middle-sized uh, 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 enterprises that are investing in Latin America without taking the necessary steps to protect the rights of the communities and uh, even more the envi environment. So we think that um, the majority of those respondents to our request to comment on complaints are Canadian, US, or European uh, large uh, multinational uh, corporations, but when we asked these small or middle-sized uh, companies based in Canada or in Mexico or in Brazil, we find that they uh, have not the necessary organization internally to respond to, to our, our request and that they do not consider human rights to be important uh, inside their business. Uh, they think uh, that's something that has to do with somebody else, not with them. They, they, they think it's about business, and that business has nothing to do with the issue of abuse and the rights and the victimization of people. So we are very concerned about this situation. As, as my colleagues have said uh, uh, before, there are thousands of millions of, of SMEs in uh, the whole Latin American region too, and we need them to understand that the language of human rights is a language that was, um, that is obligatory, it's compulsory, and that uh, even from, from the starting point of creating the, the, the company, they have to address the human rights standards internationally and nationally, uh, because if they say we are going to, com uh, to comply with the national law, therefore national laws are very strict and uh, uh, have a close relationship with the international human rights standards, then we don't find such a difficulty. We say, why? Why, why do you find it difficult to pay a fair uh, salary? to have decent work, uh, in, in decent jobs in your, in your workplace means also to address the importance of uh, overcoming gender uh, uh, discrimination or ethnic discrimination and many other uh, aspects regarding to safe and security at the workplace. Then we find that it is um, a lot to do in Latin America about SMEs, particularly because they do not um, have this information available. And also the consideration of human rights as something positive, not negative. Thank you very much. Um, I can see that Shafi is preparing to, to speak on the same uh, issue. Please. Yes. Uh, SMEs definitely play a large role not only in the Ugandan or in the African economy, but also to the world economy. As an employer's organization, 40% of our members are SMEs. When you look at the companies signed up the Global Compact in Uganda, uh, over 50% are SMEs. But uh, there is... Uh, no awareness at all about uh, human rights. When you walk to 
a typical SME in Uganda and ask them about human rights or when you talk about business and human rights chances are they look at you straight in the face and ask what the hell are you talking about human rights in business when you talk about human rights in Uganda what comes into someone's mind is uh, uh, political issues um, same-sex uh, same marriage and relationship issues but not anywhere connected to business so there's definitely uh, a huge gap a huge gap in terms of uh, lack of awareness about uh, business and human rights our organization when we started uh, when we started the local network we developed uh, a CSR toolkit our implementation of sustainability at two levels or two stages the first stage is uh, where we bring CSR implementation to companies where we work with companies, mostly SMEs, talk them into implementing CSR. Uh, and the second stage is where we ask companies to sign up for the Global Compact. Now, we, we developed a, t a toolkit to help companies uh, uh, enroll, enlist CSR amongst the operations. And uh, these companies were very surprised that human rights was one of the issues that uh, we're talking about in CSR. So I think uh, the challenge is enormous, but we really need to start. We don't have to run away. Since SMEs are definitely a big contributor, we need to do something to address and bring them on board. Thank you. Uh, OK, thank you, Alexander. Uh, Actually, I don't quite agree with this uh, uh, perception that uh, all or most of SMEs are less aware of uh, human rights issues or their uh, or their com uh, impact. Uh, at least in China, I don't think this is totally tr true. Uh, on the contrary, I think that a big portion of uh, SMEs, because they are operating in a more liberal market conditions, and they don't have uh, much uh, protection from the state, and therefore, they are much more uh, sensitive to market demands, including social demands such as uh, human rights. Uh, histor historically, uh, in, uh, among the Chinese enterprises, uh, the first group of uh, enterprises that, uh, uh, that are generally aware of uh, human rights and can make clear reference to human rights since the uh, early 90s was not, you know, was not state-owned giant companies was not even um, uh, multinationals. Actually, they were the uh, export-oriented SMEs in uh, sectors such as textile, electronics, uh, toys, etc. Uh, it's because of the CSR movements uh, based on this corporate uh, sale codes of conduct by international standards, uh, uh, by international buyers and, uh, and, the, and the brands. Uh, they first actually enlightened these Chinese SMEs uh, on the concept of human rights. So each time I go to one of my uh, our companies, uh, they will tell me, well, this year I accepted or received 20 times of human rights audit. Yeah? They, uh, they don't think that, uh, they, it's true that they don't really understand the whole concept of uh, the whole idea of human rights and the human rights law, but they refer to this, uh, uh, this uh, notion very often. Uh, one thing struck me uh, very, very deep was something happening uh, three years ago. I went to one of these, uh, our companies, and I saw a sign, a sign on one of their doors saying, Human Rights Office. That's the only sign I saw in any of Chinese companies with uh, a Human Rights Office in their company, in their uh, building. Uh, I would say the only major achievement of this COC movement by Nike, by Adidas, by Shell, all these big companies, is that they actually increase awareness of the SMEs in many things, including labor rights and, uh, and human rights. Um, so for this part of SMEs, I think they, are, they have a very uh, basic understanding of human rights. The real challenge is how to make them you know, aware of their human rights impact and the responsibility in a more uh, comprehensive and uh, uh, systematic way. Uh, but it's also true because uh, there's a big portion of uh, SMEs, they only operate in domestic ma markets, they don't accept audits, and they don't know, okay, uh, the, uh, the, 
uh, they have a they have a, uh, international business partners with uh, human rights demands. So for these companies, I think human rights awareness is a is a is a real uh, issue. Uh, but for that power portion doing export and within the international uh, supply chain, I think they are quite aware of uh, uh, of uh, uh, human rights. Uh, so basically, I say, I'm saying that uh, because SMEs they are operating more according to market rules, so they are more sensitive to market demands, uh, including human rights. Here, I would like to s support my argument with one with some figures. Uh, for instance, in China, SMEs now contribute to over 65% of uh, invention patent patents. No, only SMEs they uh, contribute to over 65% of invention patents, and uh, over 70% of enterprise technology innovations, and also over 80% of new products are developed by SMEs. So, which means SMEs they know what they want to do. They know they need to know, as well as uh, as long as the, the the market demands is very clear, they do, they will go that way. Yeah, that's my. Thank you very much, Brent. Please. Thank you. J just briefly, I mean, the issue of supply chain, yes, the supply chain can be a very useful means of being able to transmit requirements down through to small and medium-sized enterprises. But we need to avoid it becoming a transference of responsibility down the supply chain, because it's not. Every company in that supply chain has of itself the responsibility under the guidelines to be acting in accordance with the guidelines. So it's not about shifting blame down the stream. I think that's very important to do. And the issue of audit also worries me. Um, we don't want to turn human rights into an audit question uh, where you can tick the box and move on. We need to be able to avoid categorizing it as something which is just a requirement in order to secure a contract. Mm -hmm. We need to make sure it goes deeper than that somehow. Uh, we need to make it easy for these SMEs. Um, the language has to be simple that they can understand. The concepts need to be introduced slowly to them rather than all at once. Because if you do read this stuff, some of it sounds a bit scary. And I bet you now, if we went down the main road here in Geneva and started asking the shopkeepers what they knew about business and human rights, we'd get a big fat zero. <laughs> With respect, we would. Well, how would they know? Who's telling them anything? I mean, this is coming back to the state duty. If the state is serious about giving effect to human rights, then they have the control of media to be able to do this, to radio, TV, newspapers. They have the ability to put a leaflet in everyone's home. In some countries, not all. But they have the ability to come out there and reach out and tell companies what they should be expected to be doing. We can try as employer organisations through our networks to do that. But at the end of the day, if there's not the state coming in and saying, listen, people, carrot and stick, we want you to respect human rights. We're putting in place a human rights framework. We're going to tra train you on it, teach you about it, and if you don't comply, then you're going to get whacked. Then people start to understand. That's how we did it in New Zealand with health and safety. We made the penalty so severe, it was cheaper to comply with the law than to be in breach. Simple as that. And that has to come through slowly but surely through government action under the state duty to protect. Thank you, Brent. With that, so we've moved on to the next uh, issue, the issue of um, what kind of responses to challenges uh, are needed, what kind of uh, support mechanisms for SMEs are needed for them to be able to uh, manage their human rights impacts more effectively. Um, would you like to start? Uh, because I've been working with uh, SMEs uh, for like uh, eight years, uh, and I've been in this, in this process uh, of uh, CSR for the same years. So uh, I think uh, <coughs> uh, for, for capacity, uh, capacity for the awesome of, of SMEs is, is a real challenge. Uh, but this is also very uh, uh, general issue because uh, uh, that's a uh, very pop that's quite general for many SMEs. So I think that uh, solutions to these kind of challenges uh, should also look beyond SMEs themselves uh, because uh, it's not uh, a an individual solution to that issue. So I'm I think that 
I believe that the implementation of uh, guiding principles by SMEs shall rely more on uh, collective or collaborative models. So I'm proposing two uh, models uh, to implement the, the uh, guiding principles. The first one is uh, collective solutions, or I call it uh, horizontal implementation. Uh, the collective solutions or the horizontal implementation is to uh, promote the uptake and uh, understanding of deep guiding principles by business associations or chambers of uh, commerce. Ideally, to integrate these uh, guiding principles into industrial codes or uh, charters of the uh, associations or the chamber of commerce. Uh, now, uh, as far as I know, most, most of these most industry-based uh, code of conduct, like uh, uh, ICTI, ESCC, BICI, yeah, uh, they haven't yet incorporated or even made a reference to the guiding principles. So, the adoption of guiding principles by this code uh, can reach out to a big m a group of uh, SMEs. Uh, also, yes, uh, the successful factors uh, that contribute to the uh, uh, to, to such initiatives can also play a role uh, in supporting the implement, implementation of guiding principles. Uh, uh, also, I think the industry associations or, or initiatives can provide a kind of uh, a specialized platform for SMEs to exchange uh, experiences and share their challenges uh, in, in, the, in implementing the guiding principles. Uh, I think the, in, in the guiding process is called a resource for continuous study. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, in the last, in the in the past one and a half year, we have been helping the Chinese ICT industry to build their own guidance on social social responsibility. Uh, in that guidance, which is count, which is about to come this uh, by the end of this year, uh, we make we we make ex explicit reference to the guiding principles. Also, we stipulate uh, stipulate on that uh, guidance that business should uh, respect human rights. And uh, this is one of the purposes of this uh, guidance. So, uh, yes, you're, it's true that in within these ICT industries, we can say Microsoft, uh, Lenovo, Dell, HP, uh, as well as uh, you know many many suppliers of of them. So, if uh, this guidance can be implemented, I think this can be a collective solution or collective implementation or horizontal implementation of guiding principles. Uh, by collective uh, solution, I mean uh, this is kind of a vertical implementation. Uh, I, here I refer to these uh, value chain mechanisms. Uh, although it's much criticized by many people, I mean this value chain mechanism, but uh, they still have their own, you know, successful stories. So. Uh, the, imp the implementation of guiding principles uh, principle on SMEs through value chain, I think, is for now, is practically a good choice. Uh, if uh, the state duty to respect, uh, the state duty to protection is not in place. Uh, but uh, this should be uh, based on the, uh, the, the good way of brands and buyers. Because I think that uh, for human rights, they should not rely too much on on, on uh, audit and scrutiny uh, mechanisms. So instead of putting too much on this kind of things, I, I think uh, the brands and the buy, uh, buyers, they should aim to establish collaborative business relationship with their uh, SME suppliers based on the val shared value of, uh, of uh, respect for human rights. Uh, uh, so for, to do th uh, to do this, I think the first thing for the multinationals to do is to upgrade their own code of conduct as soon as possible to incorporate uh, what's uh, uh, required by the guiding principles and make them align to always the guiding principles. Uh, it also poses a new challenge for them on how to build up shared value on human rights through dialogue, capacity building, and then sometimes even hand by hand assistance. Uh, <coughs> Besides this, I, should, the, I think the big companies, the big buyers, brands in the market, they shall be aware of the human rights challenges and also the limit, uh, capacity limitations of their SME suppliers. They need to take this into consideration, serious consideration, when they make, when they make you know, uh, business decisions concerning SME uh, partners. 
for instance, uh, if uh, the, when they are negotiating uh, piece rate, lead time with their SME partners, and even in designing some products, I think they should be careful and be aware of their, 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 their own human rights responsibility and also the responsi uh, human rights responsibility of the, uh, the SMEs. So, uh, so I, be yeah. I believe that, yeah, sentence. I, think, I believe at the end of the day, I don't think that uh, in a cat and a mouse, car cat and mouse game, the mouse will, will appreciate uh, no, cat's teachings on human rights.